All right, we're back here to wrap up session three. I know this has been quite a long session. I had to break it up into parts because I, even though it's condensed, you still want to make sure, or at least I wanted to make sure, that I was still including some pertinent information for you to have in these study sessions. So this is the last part of session three. And here we're talking about the cultural group of lesbian, gay, and transgender. And we um, have, uh, in VR, have definitely been doing some major policy changes to try to make sure that our services are going to benefit and are working for individuals in this group because now we, when we're talking about racial and ethnic groups is, is one thing with an individual disability. When you're talking about an individual disability who also may happen to be lesbian, gay, or transgender, there are some whole other topics just like with racial and ethnic groups that you have to consider. And so we have to make sure that our policy um, is meeting the needs of individuals in this group, of course, as well as individuals with disabilities. So um, it's a very interesting and exciting time in VR for us. So look for many things to happen, not only here in Arkansas, but I'm sure in other states as well, if they're not already, or should already be happening now. Now the first step in the counseling process is to gain access to information that'll help one understand the social, cultural, and historical context in which lesbian women and gay men function. Gay males and lesbians are a psychological minority in the sense that lesbians and gay men were labeled as diseased by the psychological community until 1973. So that wasn't until, that wasn't so long ago. And the seventh printing of the edition of the DSM. So to even think about having your cultural group as a context to be in a context of being labeled as disease and also to be in uh, the DSM, you have to consider the psychological implications of that in working with uh, individuals in this group. Family is usually comprised of older gays and lesbians who mentor the person through the coming out process and into the gay and lesbian cultures. Now speaking of coming out, there's two types of coming out. There's coming out to the self because one has to come to the realization that they are a lesbian or gay or transgender and coming out to others, which is continuous. And that's one point that I used to always make sure to emphasize and I continue to do so with my counselors, when you're talking about um, individuals with disabilities, those who work in the field know there are the disabilities, of course, that you can actually see, those physical disabilities, but then you have what we usually refer to as those invisible disabilities, which are the, usually the mental health, psychological disability that you cannot see, that you, um, cannot just notice right off and coming out to others is can be seen as that same way because other people don't know and you're having to constantly share your identity with others um, not only for your um, sense of identity, but just because it may be important or pertinent for others to know who you are because that is a part of your identi identity. So coming out to others is can be, for many, um, psychologically dis um, stressful because it's not like it's something that is seen and people can immediately, I guess, decide or define you in their terms or however they want to do that. You have to have this conversation and this discussion sometimes with individuals. And I am sure that can be draining. So I always make sure 
or hopefully try to make sure to the students and the staff that I speak to that they need to understand how strenuous that can be on an individual and how they need to um, be aware of that when counseling with individuals within this community. Counselors need explicit awareness of their own religious and spiritual nature and beliefs as their role in sexuality and almost all national and tribal cultures is important. Remember when we were discussing earlier about the racial and ethnic groups and knowing oneself and if you're not feeling comfortable and not bringing your own personal biases and opinions into the counseling session. Of course we know that's usually rule number one. Um, when working with individual with working with individuals who are different from oneself or at least seen as different from oneself and again this is it holds the same here when working with lesbian gay or transgender individuals if you are not going to provide those same services in counseling approaches as you would anyone else then one needs to look within oneself and also make sure that they are doing the appropriate referral to another individual who they feel that can better serve them. Because it, it would be unethical, since we are getting ready to take this exam, and I know all of you will pass, it would, be, it would not be within your, the ethical ramifications for you to do a disservice to any social or cultural group. Another social cultural group that's important and that we're working more with is the elderly and gerontological. By the year 2013, the number of persons 65 and over is expected to double to 71.5 million. What is less widely known is that within this grain of the population, there will be a disproportionate growth of ethnic minority elders. So again, Let's go back. I talked about not only having on top of working with an individual with a disability, you have to consider the cultural group. And now on top of that, say you have a client who is, ha of course, has a disability because they have, remember, that's one of the criteria of determining eligibility. They're a part of a racial ethnic cultural group. What if they're in the lesbian, gay, transgendered group, and they're also part of the elderly and gerontological? Look at all those subgroups and, and things that you need to be aware of before you can even start providing those counseling uh, services and other VR services that you need to provide. So you can see now, hopefully, how important it is to be aware and have some information on in the individual's uh, cultural background. I just talked about that. When the influence of cultural ethnicity on aging, the perception of mental illness or health, and the interaction of the counselor's own ethnic identity are considered, the sources of variation and understanding are multiplied. Just what I said what I was talking about. You have all these issues and things and subgroups and groups. Just everything is just all within this one individual. And that's why it's very important. And that's why I always try to make clear that we look at the individual. That's why it's called an individualized plan for unemployment. We cannot treat every client that walks through the door exactly the same as we did the last one because we have to consider their own set of not only issues that they're bringing to the table but their cultural group and things that are areas that they identify with. That is all a part of, of providing services to that whole person. The deaf and hard of hearing And I just okay, 
sorry about that. And I and I just uh, almost hit the last slide. Um, there are about two to four of every thousand people in the United States and are that are functionally deaf. Though more than half became deaf relatively late in life, fewer than one out of every one thousand people in the United States became deaf before the the age of eighteen. So. Since, you know, this is our last group, but this is still an important group to remember. And we, and many VR agencies, if not all of them, I'm not speaking to all of them, have a department or a section that provides services to just this group. We call ours SDHH here at Arkansas Rehab Services, and it's called Services for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. So that just lets you know how very important and how very specific different services need to be provided with individuals depending on the disability um, that they are having or the cultural group that they belong to. So this is a very um, interesting group in that it, the group is a cultural group but also seen as being and having a dis as categorized as a disability. So it's a very interesting uh, group. Respecting a deaf person's primary language shows respect for them. So usually the first thing that you need to make sure as a counselor, especially one that is not well versed in sign language, and even if you are, making sure that you have an interpreter. That shows great regard for them as a cultural group and for their language. Deaf people value each other, their culture, and their shared experiences. Hard of hearing people often identify, many of them often identify with the hearing culture. So that's a very important piece um, to be aware of. And a lot of times it's just maybe even if needed, just asking what cultural group, if it's important to providing the services uh, or the counseling, which group do they identify with. And mild to moderate hearing loss even can be more frustrating to live with than deafness because you're kind of in that middle area. So you, it's, it's almost like you're not sure where you, which group to where you belong. So you can see that that can be very frustrating to individuals who fall within this area. So this is our last social and cultural group to discuss. So this is our last part uh, in this session and I hope that you were able to get some information from this that will further help you or advance you in working with various cultural groups. So I'll see you in our next session four, okay?